Welcome everybody. This I'm Julie. I'm the director here at Mill Spouse Fest and our team is so excited for this conversation today. This is one of those topic areas that um, has a lot of attention and we are so pleased to be able to bring this to you. Thanks to USAA for their sponsorship of all of our events this year. And I just couldn't be more thrilled to introduce all these panelists to you. But before we get into the content, um, I want to do a little bit about Mill Spouse Fest and I'm going to do a screen share here for you guys and we're going to kick this off and have a great conversation today. All right, give me one second while I get all of this ready to go. Okay, whoops, click the wrong button. That's just the way it goes, right? So of course I'm on the wrong screen. Who <laughs> started the prizes at the end. Um, so if you are logging in today, you are here for Mill Spouse Employment and we are going to be going for an hour and a half and you're gonna be commenting in the Whova app and we're gonna be able to read those comments and um, please engage. And this app is gonna be open all month long. And if you have a friend, who isn't here with you today, who you think would benefit from this, they can still register for that event on the 16th, even if they're not interested in entrepreneurship and view all this content because it's all gonna be recorded and you can view all the comments in the app. <clears throat> So if you're not connected with Mill Spouse Fest already, um, hopefully you are if you're here today, but if you're not, we want you to make sure that you're following us on our social media channels. We have a great website where we post articles and content, a Facebook page that's really engaged, and um, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and my new favorite, LinkedIn. So we have a new LinkedIn page and I'm sharing our articles and building our community um, on LinkedIn, which is especially cool, right, with what we've got going on here at this topic today with employment. Um, so I encourage you to do that. If you're not getting our newsletter, you can scan on your phone or type in, you know, millspousefest.com and sign up to get our newsletter. That way you're going to be the first to hear about our next upcoming events. And upcoming on the 16th, which I already mentioned, we are going to be having a conversation about what it's like to be an entrepreneur. Maybe you are one, maybe you wanna learn some new tips. Maybe you are just deciding, is this for me? So we're gonna have a great panel of people talking about that there. And I encourage you to join us on, on the 16th as well. <clears throat> okay, so today we have our co-host, Jamie Chapman. And Jamie, traveled with us to our in-person events in April. We got to really get to know each other and spend some time together. She is the co-founder and COO of the Military Spouse Chamber of Commerce. She's going to be moderating our panel discussion today. And as I already mentioned, USAA is a proud sponsor of all of Mill Spouse Fest events this year, including our MSF cast. And we're really happy to be able to introduce to you Chrissy Johnson, who's the talent strategist with USAA. And she's going to be able to talk to you a little bit more about employment and how you can get started applying for jobs directly with USAA. Denise Lewis, she is with Military Spouse Jobs, and she is really a powerhouse and a, a leader in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space as well. So we're really pleased to have Denise here. She's been a strong supporter of Mill Spouse Fest this year, so woohoo. Um, our all events sponsor, Tutor.com, Evelyn Sullivan is going to be here today um, talking about how to apply and be a tutor with Tutor.com. And Maureen Haney is our, our lead that we work with, and Tutor.com has been an amazing sponsor of all of our Mill Spouse Fest events for years. <clears throat> so maybe you've heard about um, hiring our heroes, maybe you haven't, but Kira Seely is going to be here to talk to you a little bit more about what programs they offer and how you can plug into their resources. Um, and our next panelist that I'll introduce to you is my friend Laura Torres. We actually met through networking, and that's some of what we're going to talk about today too, right? Uh, she's the Senior Manager of Workforce Development at Blue Star Families, and she runs a really engaged Facebook group and a LinkedIn group called Spouse Force. So all day long, she's helping military spouses get uh, spouse employment jobs. So shout out to Blue Star Families for being a partner of ours, and uh, she's going to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, our last panelist that I'm going to introduce is Melissa Shaw. Melissa is the Vice President of Digital Solutions at a company called Pioneer Utility Resources, and she has a really unique story that she's going to share with you all. Um, 
Um, and it just really warmed my heart. She reached out to us because she's like, I really care about military spouse employment. And I want to be able to talk to other leaders in the industry about how they can create a culture of helping hire military spouses within remote employment. So, um, and a little bit today, I will probably share a little bit about our parent company, Recurrent, and how we are a remote for first organization and some of the jobs that, that we have. Um, so that's a little bit about <clears throat> what we're gonna be doing today and how we're going to um, engage in the content. Oh, and I know you do wanna know about our prizes. Thank you to Blue Star Families for sponsoring our prizes today. Um, they were very generously offering $15 Starbucks gift card, a $50 Amazon gift card, and an HP Chromebook. So we like to give prizes away for coming in on time. And so our um, first prize winner for being on time is going to earn the $15 Starbucks gift card. And that is Carmen Rosa Fashaw. So thank you so much for being here. And one of our team members will message you through Whova to get you connected with that. And Laura will be sending those out to you. So in order to be eligible for the Amazon gift card and the HP Chromebook, you've got to stay on with us throughout the entire event today. And we will pull those names after the panel discussion. Discussion. So that's like your little extra hook to stay in um, engaged with us. So now I'm going to stop my screen sharing and I'm going to introduce Jamie and Jamie's going to be the first one to get to talk and share about what she's got going on. Hi, Jamie. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me out today. I'm representing. I've got my Mill Spouse Fest shirt on from when we were just recently traveling in May. Um, just a brief little introduction to myself so you know who this person is that's moderating today's conversation. Uh, as Julie said, I'm one of the original co-founders of the Military Spouse Chamber of Commerce. We serve military spouse business owners, entrepreneurs, and those who may be entrepreneurial or self-employed. Um, additionally, in my day job, I work for a Fortune 2 company, and I am a senior military talent program manager and it's my job to help attract military talent to Amazon Web Services. Um, additionally, I just I have a pretty deep and rich history in the human capital space and a, a deep passion for military spouse employment. So it's my pleasure to be here today moderating today's conversation. Um, I'll pipe in and chime in a little bit on my own, but I mostly want to hear from all of these amazing experts that are here today on the panel. And just a public disclaimer here, there is a lot going on at my CASA. We had a train go by a moment ago. There's a really kind gentleman, a military spouse, currently detailing my car in the driveway, and my dog barks at everything. So please be prepared for disruptions from my end. And to move along to the next person, Julie. Thank you so much. I'd like to introduce Chrissy Johnson, the talent strategist with USAA. Thank you. And thank you for having me. And this is why I have the headset on as well. So noise canceling. So you can't hear all the, the chaos going in the background. And I got my nice little background on as well to try and filter out anything that you might see movement in the background as well. I keep saying background. I apologize for that. But thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, uh, as representing USAA and as a military spouse, I understand the unique challenges. Um, of finding employment and challenges around gaps in employment and volunteer work and three pages worth of resumes and how to put all that together and make yourself shine. So I'm happy to be here. I am a talent strategist for USA and that's just a big word for I help fill a top of our funnel to Jamie's point as well, similar to what she, her duties are. Um, I help fill our funnel at USA supporting our military spouse and veteran hiring initiatives for the enterprise. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Chrissy. Okay, Denise, you are up next. We would love to hear about mill spouse jobs. All right, can, can everyone hear me? Yep. All right, so um, thanks so much for um, allowing me to be here. You know, I was always one of those military spouses, uh, 32 years of marriage, 26, move, you know, moves. Um, it was hard to find adequate employment. And so I wish we had, you know, I knew about MSJ, you know, many years ago, because the one thing that we really um, help spouses with is one-on-one -on -one 
personalized assistance. You know, you have those gaps in employment, you um, have had your child rearing years and you don't know who you wanna be right now. Maybe you were in college for education, but you wanna do something else. And we really help you narrow that down through career assessments. And then once you're um, um, ready for employment, um, you become an internal candidate. So we have a direct line to our employer partners. And we, you know, we help you wherever you are in your career needs, whether that's upskilling um, because of gaps in employment, we're there to help you however you need it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Denise. And um, I made this reference earlier, but I'm going to give another plug before I go to the next speaker, just in case I don't, I forget to mention it again. I want to make sure that everyone who's on today remembers that we have exhibitor booths inside of Whova. So I encourage you after this webinar is over to go visit those exhibitor booths and take a look around and see what they've posted in there. And if there's another question that you have that's burning that we don't get to today, then you can just connect with those resource leaders that we have on this uh, call today. The app is going to be open all month long as well, so it doesn't end today. All right, so next up, I'm going to introduce to you Kira Seely with Hiring Our Heroes. Hi everyone, my name is Kira and I'm a coordinator for the Military Spouse Professional Network Program at Hiring Our Heroes. I am also a military spouse located in Hampton Roads, Virginia, so I'm really excited to be here with you all today. And I just wanted to say thank you to the event organizers for inviting me and the Hiring Our Heroes organization to sit on this panel. Hiring Our Heroes um, is a workforce development initiative of the 501c3 arm of the US Chamber of Commerce. For over a decade now, we have served transitioning service members, veterans, and military spouses as they search for and find meaningful careers. Part of Hiring Our Heroes is the Military Spouse Program which is tailored to address the challenges that many military spouses face as they grow professionally or re-enter and enter the workforce. Whether it's upskilling, reskilling, or being connected to an employer, we're here to help military spouses find their next meaningful opportunity. I work directly with the Military Spouse Professional Network Program, which does provide vital career development and networking opportunities at many military communities around the world. Um, we currently have over 60 in-person locations, and in addition, we have a robust virtual network which serves spouses no matter where the military has taken them around the globe. This program is really special to me, not only because that I work for it, but also I was directly benefited um, by the um, opportunities that Military Spouse Professional Network has to offer in local communities. Uh, back in 2020, my husband, who's active duty Navy, and I uh, made our first military move to Virginia Beach, and I was a brand new military spouse, not really aware of all the resources um, that, I had to, that I had offered to me, and my local network provided me some great opportunities, as well as the confidence um, to get back on track and find a meaningful employment opportunity. In addition to Military Spouse Professional Network, Hiring Our Heroes has many other programs such as different fellowships located across the country. Um, we have an upskilling and reskilling program that where you can earn a Google career certificate. There are career summits and hiring fairs, both virtually and in person. And we also have specific events that are tailored to support military spouses who are um, looking for a new job. Um, so I could probably talk about the organization for more than just a few minutes here, but I just wanted to wrap up and say um, to all the spouses who are tuning in now, thank you so much for joining. Um, no matter where you are in your journey, whether you are looking for a new opportunity, uh, maybe re-entering the workforce after taking some time away to help with family, um, or maybe you're happy where you're currently at, but you're just looking to grow as a professional. This community, which you will see today, has so many amazing resources for you. Um, so thank you for taking advantage of that and being with here today. And um, Hiring Our Heroes is really looking forward to supporting you no matter where you are in your career journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kira. Um, our next panelist that I'd like to introduce to you is Laura Torres. 
Laura is with Blue Star Families and Blue Star Careers with Spouse Force. So um, just a shout out to her because the whole reason I have this job is actually because I networked with Laura. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of a, a cool little story. And um, our digital media manager also uh, found her way to Mill Spouse Fest because of Laura. So Cheers you guys find your way towards the talent because of your talent. I just happened to make the introductions. That's it. <laughs> How are you guys doing today? I'm Laura Torres, Senior Manager of Workforce Development here at Blue Star Families. Thank you so much for the invite, um, Julie. I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to support. Um, I'm a military spouse and we're retiree now. We retired after 21 years of service in the Marine Corps here in the San Diego area. We made San Diego or happily ever after. And uh, just like you know, many of our members from the military spouse community, I struggle to find military-driven um, sort of a resources and employment opportunities during my time as we were transitioning out of the military, trying to find and secure something. But anyway, what happens here at uh, Blue Star Careers is we have tailored a virtual community that we call sponsors, where every day we identify employers, training resources, and opportunities to to help you really navigate and identify those solutions that will fit your current lifestyle. There's no one size fits all. There's no one employer, one process fits all. So what we try to do is we try to every day bring you the most current up-to-date activities, resources, hiring partners, uh, most up-to-date uh, immediate hiring opportunities that my partners send via email so that we can share those with those that are actively seeking as well as those that are casually looking so that you can educate yourself about what are some of those um, you know, friendly military spouse resources out there, but also get in and get a track of your sort of a little bit more awareness of where you fit in some of those career opportunities. We want you to, you know, feel uh, even with all the faces of the challenges the military life brings your way to feel that you have a community, you have a place where you can come back on a regular basis and canvas and review resources. And then if you need more support one-on-one -on -one beyond that, then we're able to offer you, refer you out to our partners or be, meet up with you guys. But the most important thing is we have made it super user-friendly because at the end of the day guys let me tell you it's your career it's your story and we just want to be there to support you so we want to make sure that you learn how to ask for help that you add, learn how to make yourself accessible as well so that we can very intentionally look for that great career opportunity and that's what we do over there at sponsors whether it's part-time full-time I mean you name it everything that it, it comes our way, we try to share it as long as it's a good fit for our military lifestyle community. And we have a great team that we uh, scout and we sort of uh, pre-screen some of those opportunities and we want to make sure that we do that. But we also have learning opportunities. We partnered up last year with Coursera and we got a, um, a really great opportunity for military spouses to learn and upskill their career through the Spouse First Learning Hub. So, you know, we have cohorts or groups that are going into project management, others that have done the Intuit certification. Uh, we're getting ready to do a Grow with Google uh, e-commerce certification for people that have marketing uh, trends and enthusiasm right there. And uh, all kinds of things we're always looking to either not just support you to get back into the workforce, but also stay up to date with the latest trends. Because let me tell you, this workforce development situation moves fast most fast and you have to be career ready. And we're very grateful for the opportunity to always share the resources at Spotsworth so that you can stay completely, completely on track of what your uh, specific career needs might be because they might change in six months, but we wanna make sure that you know that you have a community and that's over here at Blue Star Careers and our virtual community Spotsworth. Thank you. Thanks so much, Laura. I appreciate that. And uh, next, I'm going to introduce Melissa Shaw and let, ask her to share about her career and her journey. Well, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning if you're like me and you're out on the on the western side of the United States. It's great to be here. Um, as Julie mentioned earlier on in the webinar today, my story is that my husband and I got married. I had my own career. We were 30 when I met him. And so I already had 10 years of career experience. And I had to take a big step back in my career because not long after we got married, we got sent to Germany for four years. While I was overseas, I kept trying to convince my, my freelancing clients. I'd gone from agency side marketing to, to doing freelance work. And I kept trying to convince folks I was an asset to them. 
because while they were asleep at night or they were at their kids ball game, I could be working. They could send me a last minute press release at four o'clock in the afternoon and I could proof it for them or they could send me the facts and I could write it for them. And when they would come into work the next morning, I'd be waiting for them. And it just didn't resonate. I wasn't able to, to really convince folks of the value of that for them. Fast forward a couple of years and I had an opportunity to do some freelance work for um, America's electric cooperatives. So we serve rural electric utilities all around the United States and broadband utilities as well. I had the chance to do some freelance work that led to the opportunity to become a business owner with the two gentlemen I had been doing freelance work for. The company that we had together was called Arc Media. And from very early on in my time there, we identified the need to have someone keep an eye on social media networks for utilities overnight. If you expect your lights to be on 24 hours a day, right? You expect your lights to work all the time, your broadband to work all the time. You want somebody to talk to you and it doesn't work. We were doing social media communications for these utilities, but they would have questions come in at 10 o'clock at night or at midnight and we were asleep. We couldn't answer them for those utilities. So actually on the, um, somewhere in our audience today is one of our employees, Rachel Marston. Rachel came on board with us um, in May of 2016, 2017. And she was our first overnight employee of the company. She and her husband were going to Korea. And so she became the first overnight employee. She helped us monitor those social media accounts overnight. Now, fast forward to 2022. And at ARC Media, we built a military spouse employment program with myself and Rachel being the first two employees. Um, we currently have more than 10% of our staff are active duty military spouses or were when we hired them. Some have since their families have retired since then. One is divorced since then. Um, the company that I was a co-owner of, ARC Media, was purchased by Pioneer Utility Resources in March of uh, 2020. And so we've been part of the bigger company now for two years. And I have been able to successfully advocate for military spouse employment as part of our bigger, more mature organization now. So the organization serves over, um, over 300 utilities across the United States. We have more than 90 employees and 13 of those at the moment are military spouses. Through that program, um, we have been able to help with recruiting military spouses, understanding how to read a military spouse's resume, understand their career gaps, interpret their volunteer experiences, and help identify translatable skills from those volunteer experiences into what we do in our organization. And the program has been extremely successful. Once we've brought employees into the organization, most of them have stayed with us, except for one, Laura, who left us to become your social media account manager at Blue Star Families. So I'm so happy to be here today. I can't wait to be part of the panel. And um, I'm really honored to be sitting alongside so many folks who care so much about the military spouse employment and underemployment issues across the states. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, and uh, next, we're going to introduce our all events sponsor for this year, Maureen Haney. And she's going to have, um, here we go. So we've got everyone on. And <clears throat> Maureen, I would love for you to uh, kick this off for us. Are you there? I think you're unmuted now, Maureen. I'm sorry, I wasn't getting the audio. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I apologize, I'm coming to you from, uh, I'm, I'm traveling, so I'm in transit here. Um, and I didn't hear anything that you guys just said. So are we introducing ourselves? Yes, uh, you're ready to go. Um, Maureen, okay. I introduced you and please go ahead and kick off. Okay, I apologize, guys. I am in a, a technology <laughs> coma here. Okay, good. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm Maureen Haney, and I'm the senior program manager with the tutor.com for US Military Families program. And I'm here with the lovely Evelyn Sullivan, who um, I'll let her introduce herself, but she works with our learning services, which is where we hire all of our amazing tutors. So if you don't know, all of our military families have no cost access to tutor.com. Um, and you can use it 24 seven as much as you like, but to do that, we have to have amazing tutors. And Evelyn is the person that brings all of them on board. It is a great job for a military spouse. And I'm not gonna say any more because Evelyn is going to share the rest with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maureen. Hi everyone. Uh, I am just going to figure out 
one technical thing to share my screen because we have a little bit of a trivia built into our uh, presentation today. And um, it's just for fun. Feel free to hop in the chat. We don't expect you to know this, but we appreciate best guesses. And just some fun facts about Mill Spouses that we've had as tutors at tutor.com. Uh, just a little background before I do that, I have been with tutor.com for just over 15 years, I'm the director of onboarding, which is a fancy way of saying hiring. And it is my job to work closely with the recruitment team to push our applicants through the process, troubleshoot any issues that they might have, and just do what I can to make the whole experience uh, a pleasant one for everyone. And uh, this way we have successful tutors. So let me just share my screen and please let me know, can you see this uh, screen with a little uh, PowerPoint on it? Thank you, Maureen. Okay, let's jump on in. All right, tutor trivia, fun facts and how to apply to tutor.com. So over the years, we've had this many mill spouses tutor with us. Is it A, 378, B, 526, C, 732, or D, 864? So feel free to chat your guesses. The answer is 864, which is amazing. True or false, historically speaking, most of the mill spouse tutors have listed their spouse as currently serving Army active duty full time. You have a 50 50 shot here. This is true. Currently serving Army active duty full time has been our most popular choice, followed by veteran Army active duty full time, currently serving Air Force active duty full time, veteran Navy active duty full time, and currently serving Navy active duty full time. So great representation. Currently, we have 99 active mill spouses, and we could use more, um, most of whom who are spouses of veteran Army active duty full time veteran Navy active duty full-time, currently serving Air Force active duty full-time, currently serving Navy active duty full-time, and currently serving Army active duty full-time. So if I wanna become a tutor, where should I go? It's very simple, just go to tutor.com slash apply. What does the application process entail? So uh, you will fill out a basic form just to make sure you meet our requirements. Um, it's nothing too difficult. We just want to make sure your computer meets our tech requirements. Um, it should take just a few minutes to fill out and you'll know right away once you hit submit whether you meet those requirements or not. Um, after which you'll be invited to take one of our subject exams. This is a qualifying exam. So if you want to be a chemistry tutor, you'll take our chemistry exam. And it's um, most of our exams are 50 questions, multiple choice and timed. You can use resources to complete them. And in some cases, if another institution or entity has done the vetting beforehand, we don't need you to take that exam. We have what we call fast track questionnaires. So for example, if you are a CPA, you take our CPA approved, quote unquote exam. And that's just essentially four or five questions saying, are you a CPA? Is your license current? Can you prove this later in the process? Okay, great, right this way. So um, that applies to certifications. It applies to certain levels of um, education. If you've earned a master's degree in a certain subject, um, and they'll specify in the introduction of every exam, whether it is one of those fast tracks or it's the full exam. So let's say you've passed uh, a subject exam that we need tutors for. You'll then be invited to participate in what we call our classroom introduction and interview. And it's exactly what it sounds like. You will connect in our online classroom with one of our representatives. They'll do a little tour of the classroom features. Here's where you chat. Here's how you share documents, et cetera. And then they'll just ask you very basic interview questions, if you have any tutoring experience, why you want to be a tutor. Um, it's very 
casual and engaging. And then you move on to the HR processing, um, create a tutor profile, and welcome to tutor.com. So how much does it pay? This varies greatly um, depending on the subject matter that you'd like to tutor. And I will make a note here, um, the range is quite broad. And in areas where the cost of living is higher, we do adjust the pay rate accordingly. So how do I get sessions? This is the wonderful part. We are a 24 seven online service. So you don't have to drive anywhere. You could do it in the comfort of your home or your dorm or wherever you happen to be. Um, you don't have to go looking for students because we have six or 7,000 sessions each night in over 250 subjects. So people are gonna come to you for help. Um, there are two ways that you personally can get sessions. One is what we call floating. And that is any time that you have free time, you're like, hmm, I wanna help some students. You log into the classroom, set yourself as available. You're not on any kind of schedule. So you could just connect with a few students, and then decide to go take care of other things and log off. Um, the other option is to set a schedule um, this is something that you can choose from available hours week to week. So you would choose your hours this week for the following week, depending on availability. And you could do a combination of the two, whatever suits your needs. Um, that is the biggest draw that we hear from our tutors is the flexibility. And on average, we ask the tutors are available about five hours per week um, to help with students. And we understand in the summer, there's not as much usage, so many of our tutors, you know, take a break or have limited hours. And lastly, I'm just going to wrap up with some milestones. How many sessions has tutor.com conducted? This one blows my mind. The answer is over 22 million sessions, and we are quickly approaching 23 million. I still remember the 5 million celebration many, many years ago. Um, it's just been incredible being able to impact the lives of so many students. Um, it's just wonderful. And lastly, a little plug to become a tutor. Some tutors have been with us for over 20 years, true or false. Spoiler alert. Okay, it's true. We have four tutors who have been with us over 20 years. That's basically since we started. Uh, we have 46 tutors who have been in the 15 to 20 year range, which is incredible. And uh, 143 tutors who have been with us 10 to 15 years. So thank you for your time. Uh, again, I'd like to plug tutor.com slash apply. And uh, we look forward to working with you someday. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ev. And let's uh, let's get the Marine Corps and Space Force represented in our tutors, okay? I noticed those were lacking, so. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, you're on mute, my dear. Thank you. I was doing that because I didn't want to make noise in the background while I was clicking on <laughs> over here. Uh, thank you both so much for your time today. And I hope everyone in, engages and goes and visits your um, visits your booth. So um, Jamie, I'm going to bring you uh, back on here. So please go ahead. So um, I wanted to share one little quick thing though with you um, before I have you officially start start the panel. So I went ahead and I was in Whova and I don't know if you knew that I put out a poll this morning. I don't know if you saw that. Um, where are you in your employment journey? And I asked them to check all that apply. So of the 58 replies we had, 19 said they're full-time employed. 10 have part-time employment, 14 are unemployed, 25 of those are job seekers and eight are self-employed. So I just kept job seeker all together separate so they could be part of that full-time or part-time employee section. So anyway, you guys can go view those poll results. 
Awesome. Well, as we kick off the conversation, the Mill Spouse Fest team will be dropping any of your questions from Whova into our feed so that we're able to see them and hopefully get to them live. To kick off our conversation, I wanted to talk about maybe something a little bit more foundational to the military spouse employment conversation and pick on a few of our guest speakers here for their opinion. And so I wanted to ask specifically, my question is, what do you believe is the root cause of severe military spouse unemployment and underemployment? Uh, for some context, historically, for the past 10 or so years we've been tracking it, military spouse unemployment has hovered around 22 or 24 percent and has statistically remained unchanged. Then we entered into this little thing called the pandemic, and I have seen estimates all over the page. What we sort of have agreed upon in the military spouse unemployment world is that military spouses are roughly unemployed at about 30% right now, which is as best of a, an estimation as we can have in a pandemic um, world. So I want to specifically pick on um, Blue Star Families and Laura Torres, and I specifically want to pick on Denise Lewis from Military Spouse Jobs to answer this question. Oh, well, oh, uh, well, one of our key things that we know um, with military spouse jobs is we have a campaign um, because we know Army spouses are also really affected because of the constant moves and the remote duty stations. Um, and so we're really trying to, you know, help with that population in terms of outreaching and getting um, our services and resources to them. But one of the key things is granted during um, the pandemic, kids were home and it was hard to be the parent and the, the teacher and even to consider work. Um, but now that the pandemic hopefully is, you know, behind us, one of the things that, you know, is a big suggestion is childcare. Spouses sometimes, you know, don't feel that it's cost effective to work because of the expense. Um, so with that, you know, just spouses take into consideration, you know, using your spouse and whatever, um, you know, income you make and split it jointly. Um, so maybe that can be uh, something to help. And then always upskill. Make sure that during those times, if you you know, or during those childcare years, um, make sure that you're upskilling and staying relevant. So when it is time to work, um, you're ready. Perfect. Uh, and I don't know, definitely I'm gonna have to agree with Denise as well too. Uh, you know, three three main factors that we have seen, and obviously through our military lifestyle survey here at Blue Star Families, uh, one of the big things that continues to come back, and I think we all know that, those of us who, uh, you know, we lived on base uh, when we moved here to San Diego in 2009, and we stayed on base up until he retired. I never went and lived out uh, because, number one, just feeling safe. However, childcare was extremely uh, scattered and continues to be a challenge. So definitely childcare is, is a huge part of, uh, you know, the lack of, um, the, really blacks our ability to be able to really go out and explore opportunities where the majority of our military spouse community, at least for both our families and with based on our pipeline, six, over 60% of them have already a bachelor's, uh, over 35% have already completed a master's. And so it's a great talented military spouse community with great careers, great education, and for you to go out and find career opportunities in the local area that are sometimes are not equivalent to what you invested in your lifetime to prepare yourself with good, a good salary, with a good you know, flexibility to meet your lifestyle, and then you lack childcare. And in, in that, that really puts a, it hinders your ability to be able to go out and explore those flexible opportunities or better yet, those very suited opportunities that meet your lifestyle, your, your career. Uh, so you often end up then downsizing to jobs that are a little more flexible, perhaps allow you to have a little more 
in and out sort of, uh, you know, situations where you can accommodate you, but then you lose on obviously financially, and then you lose on career progression. And so that is one key, definitely childcare. It's a huge one. Uh, the inability, depending on where you are in a branch of service, the inability to come with your spouse, you know, it's pretty much most of all, I don't know about you guys, but for me, once I, uh, Hector in the deployments started like coming, I was a single parent for almost half of our military life here. Uh, because he was always gone. He was always, he was absolutely not reliable, early trainings, late trainings, uh, you know, two or three week uh, uh, training and in situations where he would just go on and about and is absolutely not able to count on him. So that is a huge thing. When So when you are relocating, when you're moving around, you lose your network, you don't have family. And so that is another factor that it, why sometimes it's very struggling for military spouses to find that that ability to secure a job because you don't have that network. You don't have the sense of belonging in your community. And, you know, quite often then why, why go out and, and sort of uh, try to recreate and, 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 you know, find opportunities for yourself when you don't feel in a sense, you have a good sense of belonging or you don't have the peace of mind where your children are gonna be. And then another factor, which I think is a great, great, you know, that's what we're trying to do here at Spouse Wars and Richard Community uh, through a careers program is the lack of awareness and understanding how the different priority sectors for each community works. When you come to San Diego, and that happened to me many years ago, uh, when I moved, we moved to Oregon, you know, a few years back, to, um, to go into Fort Hector for recruiting duty, I didn't have a hard time finding a job. In fact, I almost got hired just on my way driving to Oregon to secure a job because back there in a very rural area, when he was uh, getting settled for recruiting duty, being a bilingual with an associate back then was like, whoa, like a shiny golden star coming into a very rural community where, where you know, my skills were super welcomed. I hurry up back then and I finished my bachelor's and then I thought, oh my God, I'm going to move back to um, San Diego where I'm going to have just the most incredible opportunities and you, you know, your name and all that. Moved down to San Diego a few years later uh, and uh, it was completely the opposite of what I expected because guess what? San Diego has about just about every other person. It's bilingual or trilingual in almost every other language. So the level of competition where I was coming to was extremely, extremely intimidating. Uh, the level of preparation from a lot of professionals out here, it, it was just also another, another um, area of competition that I did not expect it. So we need to really understand what is our market in some of those local communities? What are, what are some of those priority sectors that the community has in regards to where they push a lot more jobs and a lot of more well compensated jobs? And then start connecting with the local resources such as workforce development, local programs like ourselves, uh, you know, local entities within the installation because we secure partnerships with key people so that we can help them and navigate and find talented in, in pipeline and help them build pipeline members. But we have to really be very, very intentional to go out and network and secure those, those, uh, 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 build those opportunities and those uh, partnerships, those members, uh, uh, just being very aware of what are those key sectors. If I was to relocate now to, you know, the Midwest, it, my priority sectors back then will be very different. Uh, probably the career-wise and opportunities out there, it's different industries that the local workforce development, the local economy pushes out. And so do, you need to be more, a little bit more aware of those. Uh, also be aware of that when you are upscaling, when you are looking for different certifications to make sure that they are actually a good fit for other opportunities within those areas. But anyway, that's that's a little bit of what I think it's it's um, affecting a little of some of the military spouse. Thank you both. Just, um, it leads me into a good segue because you bring up this concept, Laura, of being a global population living in a local community, at least for now. And so I wanted to ask another question um, and I wanna pick on Kira and, and um, I wanna pick on Melissa for this. So the, the reason I wanted to speak with you both about this particular question is because I believe hiring our heroes has done a wonderful job at taking this global population and also building up a network in local communities of military spouses and military families. 
And then Melissa, you've kind of been all over the globe. You lived overseas. Now you're back in the U.S. and you're trying to be intentional about how your company is leveraging people all over the place. And so how can the community, be it local or a national community, because we all live in different communities, right? How can the community or the organizations that you work for best support military spouses? Sure, I'm happy to kick us off. Um, I think the number one way that our community and organizations can support spouses in, in different locations um, is really understanding that each spouse is at a, a different part in their, their career journeys. Um, and some of them might be at, at areas where they're maybe just starting out looking for an entry level job. Some might need some upskilling um, and some might have been in their careers for 20 plus years. And so it is really important to provide a variety of events and programming to make sure that we're reaching spouses um, where they're at, but also still giving them ways that they can grow as a professional. Um, I really enjoy the remote landscape that we've seen um, happen with events and programs. And although we're moving out of that and back into in-person events, which I also think is so important, uh, it's definitely important to continue to provide those virtual opportunities because some spouses might be um, in a place where maybe they can't leave home because they do have to take care of family members or perhaps they're in a location where there is not an in-person event being offered to them. Um, so keeping with the flexibility and the variety of opportunities is a way we can continue supporting spouses in their, their career endeavors. I would absolutely reinforce the need for flexibility. <clears throat> My military spouse employees are some of the most resilient and hardworking people, not surprisingly, that we have, that I've ever worked with. But oftentimes they need to know that we can give them the flexibility they need to get the work done um, in a way that works for them. And that might be that we let them keep their cameras turned off during a video call because they're having to work from a parking lot someplace, you know, I mean, you just like wait, waiting for their kids to, you know, come out or um, flexibility in terms of human resource policies. In our organizations, we, we've created specific human resource policies, both in the original company and now in our parent company at Pioneer that empower military spouses to take the time they need without it coming out of FMLA leave or coming out of vacation time to handle a PCS or to handle my my husband has a squadron command, a change of command ceremony in a week and a half. I'll be able to take the day off that day and it's not going to count as vacation time. That type of support is really important. And another thing that I've thought about in terms of local communities is that when we have a position become available in the organization that would be a good fit for an overseas, like an ACONUS military spouse to apply for, it's actually really difficult to get those jobs shared overseas in the local installations. I end up relying very heavily on existing overseas spouses who have uh, membership in local Facebook pages to share jobs there. It would be amazing if there was an easier way for me to contact uh, in some cases on the army side of, of, of things, sometimes it's the MWR program that will, that will have some sort of a career person um, on the overseas duty station. It would be really cool if there were some system in place where I could say, hey, I have a job posting, here it goes, and it's gonna get published to the pages that whatever job boards exist on the overseas duty stations. That would be a really cool thing because if you're overseas, if you're one of those army families, I think um, Laura, it may have been you that mentioned that army families in particular, we get sent to weird places and we move a lot. Um, we were averaging every 14 months before we transitioned to Space Force. And so if you have the opportunity to look for remote jobs, sometimes you spend a lot of time searching for the remote jobs and finding out there's some loophole in that job that doesn't apply to your the country you live in and their, um, their policies or to the, the amount that you move. And so if there was a way for us as employers to share our jobs more directly with the communities that would be a good fit for those jobs, it could be mutually beneficial. It could make my hiring process a lot faster every time one of those positions comes up and it could get, a, get you know create an opening for one of those overseas spouses in their local community to find work that would help support their family while they're, you know, a CONUS. Thank you both. Um, I for a kind of a micro picture of this macro perspective, uh, I'm an army spouse as well. I'm also a veteran and, you know, personally I've had 14 addresses in 16 years, right? I've managed to maintain a full-time career throughout that time. And I've had a pretty extreme amount of 
of relocations um, on the spectrum of things compared to some other military families. But I mean, that's not a surprising number if you talk to military families to hear about somebody moving 14 times. And so this is kind of just a sneak peek behind the curtain of what you're having to deal with, because every time you relocate, you know, during the last relocation I had, we were moving, I was pregnant, it was a pandemic, we had a nine month long wait list for daycare, and it was like the whole host of problems hit me in the face all at once. And so it's really great to hear your perspectives on how the, the communities and or organizations can support military spouses. So I want to transition. I want to keep Melissa on and then also bring on Chrissy from USAA. And I want to talk about a concept that I'm going to call self-advocacy. Um, how do you believe that a military spouse can best advocate for themselves through the career process? It's truthfully really difficult when you're moving so many times you know, just for me telling my references that, hey, I'm moving again and I'm applying for another job again, they're probably exhausted from being my references, right? Um, just how can a military spouse best advocate for their self uh, throughout their career? Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Melissa, I'll jump right in here if that's okay. Um, from a organization point of view, um, we don't look for references, right? So it's hard as a military spouse keeping those references as you move anyway, OCONUS and you know everybody, you lose touch with people um, and it just happens. So luckily most organizations don't ask for references. So as a spouse, it is extremely important that you um, network and you find mentors and you keep those connections via platforms such as LinkedIn. Now, of course, you have to be purposeful with those and in, with your intention. You can't just reach out to somebody and say, hey, can you get me a job? That's not what networking is about. It is making those connections and extending um, your, your reach and asking you know, for 15 minutes for a virtual coffee or whatever it may be to interact with those individuals. And it's like individuals, right? So um, you wouldn't want to you know, connect with somebody in IT when you're an HR professional, it just doesn't really make any sense unless you're trying to, you know, make a career move, something like that. Or when you move into um, different areas, um, because you have PCS, I know somebody put it in the chat about spouse clubs. There's a great opportunity to join these events and join events like this, um, hiring our heroes, um, MSEP, those types of um, organizations that can help you make those connections. And then when you do attend, and self activate for yourself events such as these, it is putting yourself out there and opening the door to make connections and to keep making, you know, I've already started LinkedIn in with everybody on this call. So it's those types of things. You just, you just have to put yourself out there and just start extending a virtual handshake. Um, Cause the, the bigger your network is, the more you're advocating for yourself and what you're looking at doing. Thank you, Chrissy. And while she just brought this up, I think it's a great idea. If you're watching and you're interested in networking and connecting together with other military spouses, maybe drop your LinkedIn URL in here so that we can connect with each other and sort of a round robin. Melissa, the reason I specifically wanted you here for this question is because just whenever you were talking about um, working for an organization and just trying to sell yourself, like, hey, I can work overnight. I'm over here somewhere overseas. And I can be an asset to your company because I'm on a different time zone and I, I can bring value to you for that. And so in talking about how you can best advocate for yourself, do you have any tips for the audience here on what's worked for you and maybe what hasn't? I should be completely transparent that um, I wouldn't be where I am today. I've been with the same company now, um, counting the original company and the, and the company that acquired us. I have been working with the same organization now for around six years which as a, up until recently, I was an army spouse, uh, December, I became a space force spouse instead. And so I, my career progression is more in the army world and that's unheard of. I don't know any other army. I, I do not know a single other army spouse in my network who was able to stay with one organization for six years. I wouldn't have been able to do that if it hadn't been for networking I had done just prior to becoming a military spouse. I was very, very involved before, before I became a military spouse. And this would apply to current military spouses as well, I found a couple of local organizations in the city where I lived and I got involved in those for my industry. Specifically in my case, it was the Social Media Club of St. Louis, which sounds really, really geeky, but through that I did some networking. I made great relationships 
And so when I announced on Twitter um, in 2012 that we were leaving Colorado Springs and going to Germany, so I was leaving my agency job and becoming a freelancer, within minutes, I had my first freelance gig. I recognize that that is not normal, <laughs> but it came from the networking that I had done in the social media club of St. Louis a few years before. Some people that I knew there thought uh, highly of me. They knew that I was good for the work. They had a, 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 a opportunity come open that was really good fit for my skill set. So I got a private message on Twitter within minutes of launching my new website and announcing to the world, hey, I'm a freelancer now. And that gave me the first little tiny foot in the door. I think that from my perspective as an employer and as someone who has done a whole lot of hiring over the last five or six years I have done at Arc Media, I did almost all of our hiring. And at Pioneer, I still do a lot of our hiring and I, and I do a lot of the recruiting and I filter a lot of the resumes for us, even though my role is not in human resources. And one thing that I can say is that you would be surprised how many people don't follow directions in your application process. They don't show up for an interview. They show up unprepared, unprepared or behaving. And, and like I had somebody show up for an interview today in shorts and a t-shirt, just like completely casual. And I thought, you know, I get that we're in 2022 and it's a post COVID, like a, not post COVID, but you know, post quarantine environment and everybody's working from home and more comfortable. But I do expect that if you were on a client call for our organization, you would not be in shorts and a t-shirt. So please don't present yourself in an interview that way, right? So military spouses are good at following regs we're good at taking care of the technical and making sure that the stuff gets done, apply that. If you can get your foot in the door even a little bit, or if you can get that coffee that Chrissy, uh, Chrissy, right? I, I'm so sorry, I said that and I was like, wait a second, I second guess myself. If you get that coffee with somebody in your industry, take it seriously, come prepared, think about what questions you wanna ask in advance, think about what your goal is for that conversation. And my goodness, if you're lucky enough to get that interview or get that freelance opportunity, give it your all. Do your very, very best in that. and I promise it will show because there are so many candidates out right out there right now who show up with a sense of entitlement. And I think that our community doesn't know what that word means. We work for everything we have. That's awesome. As we get ready to close out the hour here, Julie, I have one more question and anybody is welcome to answer it. So if you don't mind keeping your answers to the five B's, be brief, baby, be brief. I would love to hear if anyone has an example of a success story of a military spouse who has found career success despite all the odds and wouldn't mind sharing it really quickly. Let me tell you something really quick. <laughs> Just last week, I made an introduction on LinkedIn. One of my, uh, one of my uh, connections uh, through Spouseworks and many years back, reached out and posted herself. She advocated for herself and said, LinkedIn community, I am now in, in searching for a new a new job or whatever. So I immediately reached out to her, sent her a message, started tagging her to different opportunities. She ended up in the Lisa Shaw's uh, database. And guess what? Yes. Over the yes. weekend, she ended up texting me and saying, Laura, I got the job. Why? Because number one, she was career ready. She advocated for herself and made an announcement so that all of her network, all of her people that are connected with her could help her. And then number three, she got her, she got her game on the road. She knew what she wanted. So anyway, I just want to say that. That's I'll awesome. That, Laura, that she, she applied for the job within less than an hour of me sharing the link with her. She applied, she customized her resume and customized her, her intro um, to the application all in that time. Almost no one else who applied customized anything. And when she showed up for her interview, she was juggling her three-year-old baby. She was feeding the baby the whole time. And she carried herself with absolute poise and professionalism, even though she didn't yet have childcare. When we asked her about childcare, she said, my husband and I already have a plan. I can start on Tuesday. So Monday was the holiday. She started on Tuesday. Her nanny started on Tuesday. And I've been chatting with her all morning, getting her set up on Dropbox. So, so far, she's a superstar. That's awesome. Yes, but that is that is key right there. You must be career ready. When you hear those, that means you get all of your eggs and baskets, all of those things, just get ready, your resume, your spill, what you're looking for, your intentions, and then you start scouting. Mm -hmm. All right. I love, awesome. that. I love that story. So Jamie, would you indulge me so I can share also? <laughs> well, I was just going to say we have two minutes left. Uh, uh, we're going to 1.30. Oh, 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 never mind. I thought we had uh, only two minutes left. Well, no, we've got a lot more questions on my list that we can yeah, certainly we, answer. We can go all the way to 1.30. I booked this 
for that's the 16th you're thinking that's an hour um but i did want to mm. share because i am like every military spouse who i've been a spouse for 26 years now and i have had uh, i have a smorgasbord on my resume that's what i like to say and it took me a very long time it took me two years to get this position that i'm in now and I was networked. <laughs> I mean, maybe my resume wasn't quite targeted the right way. I will say that I definitely struggled with how to capture those volunteer jobs and those leadership jobs and get those uh, characteristics out onto my resume. Um, but it, it was it was a struggle. So my I guess my whole point with all of this is just keep keep at it, use your network and talk and network to people and ask them to take a look at what you have, because maybe there's something that you're just not looking at, um, that you're, you're so deep in it that you're not looking at that 30,000 foot view to kind of figure out what you need to pull out. And sometimes it just really takes a total refresh on your whole resume. Like if you haven't, if you take what you did 15 years ago and try to update it, it might not really, it's not going to play anymore because that's not how resumes are, are working today. You've got to have a different kind of a resume. So it takes work and it's not like, you know, to what Melissa and Laura were going to be uh, what they were talking about. Like if you find a job and you haven't already done that work on your resume, you're not ready to apply for that job. So you've got to dedicate the time and really dig in and do that work um, ahead of time. So that that's just what I wanted to share since I just went through this um, myself over the past, you know, couple of years. So thank you. On the topic of resumes, I have a question and it can be anyone to answer it. What is your best non-traditional career advice that you have to offer for a military spouse? I'll go first. Functional resume. Because to Julie's point, how are you going to highlight your gaps? How are you going to explain your gaps? How are you going to ex explain your volunteerism and the spaces within your and not non-linear career paths? So the best way, I don't know if Melissa agrees with me or not, but from a military spouse perspective as well, I prefer a functional resume. You can even do a hybrid model. They do hybrid models today to Julie's point about the different um, resumes, but that way you can pull all of your skill sets together and it's not in chronological order. And you don't have to try and explain in a snapshot because keep in mind, recruiters only have seven to 12 seconds to review your resume. That's not to get the interview. That's to see if they're either going to review you to bring you in for the interview. So within that time frame, you need to sell yourself. So those skill sets, hard skill sets at the top, I always recommend save those soft skill sets for your interview, even though they are important. It says a lot about you, but it's not quantifiable. If you say you're a team player and that could save your real estate for additional skill sets on your resume, do it because I'm going to assume you're a team player. And I can't quantify that. And nobody's going to answer no to that. And nobody's going to question if you're a team player or not. So save that real estate to really sell those hard skill sets on that functional resume. Does Did anyone you... else have non-traditional career advice? I'll chime in real quick. Um, and, you know, and Chrissy's so right. And I, and I think, too, with a lot of military spouses, we do a lot of things. You know, we're lotisticians, we're accountants, you know, we're the vacation planners. And it's using an organization like ours to be able to translate that experience, that volunteer experience, whether you're an FRG leader, that is really some significant experience that sometimes we just think, oh, I'm just doing it just to help out. No, that's really, um, you know, some um, hard skills there. So, you know, find those organizations like ours that can really help translate that volunteer experience into resume experience. I, I will put one out there as well. And this one is an example I have there was a gal who was um, stationed over in South Korea and was sharing openly on LinkedIn about her employment journey as a military spouse. And this was just through a series of months and you know a post every other day or so on LinkedIn about the kind of different struggles and challenges and victories that she was having in her career search. And this gal and I, we really didn't have any connections in common we really didn't have anything in common other than I happened across her posts one of these days on LinkedIn and I found her. It interested me because I'm very interested in military spouses career journeys 
And so I followed this gal's uh, posts from then on out. And I never would have met her or ran into her in any other capacity had her name not popped up on my LinkedIn feed and had she not consistently shared a little bit about her journey on there. So that's definitely non-traditional is to use social media and share out little professional stories about your journey and your challenges. Um, ultimately, you know, I was thinking of ways I could try to steal her. I work it in tech. Um, that's the folks that we try to bring onto our team. And she did um, some other career field, but I was trying to think of ways I could steal her and bring her into my ecosystem. However, she ended up getting hired and I'm really proud of her for that, but maybe uh, sharing a bit about your story on social media is a unique way to get exposure to different audiences that you might not otherwise. Um, so if anybody else has non-traditional career advice, uh, say it now or forever hold your peace before I move on to the next question. All right. I take that silence as maybe move on to the next question. So uh, we had some interest in the comments about remote employment and, and things like that. I know that as a military spouse, I'm very biased. Uh, I believe that military spouses are the world's premier workforce as I've heard it phrased by someone much smarter than myself. And I believe the pandemic has given us this golden opportunity to prove ourselves as the best remote for workforce in the world. And so I would love to pull on um, anybody who would love to talk about what you believe the pandemic has brought as opportunity for military spouses in kind of a during and post pandemic world. Kira, you're muted, muted and now you're unmuted, but now you're unmuted. I must I'll have, let you go first. <laughs> I, must have, I must have been by accident, but um, I would just like to say that as um, a spouse who, you know, found their, found um, meaningful employment during COVID. Um, it was remote, right? It was remote work. And I had never considered, considered remote work before this, but I will say that I absolutely love it now. And I see every day through my interactions with other military spouses, the amazing benefits that remote work has um, for this community. And so one of the amazing things that I do think came out of the pandemic, although many challenges, is this you know, new enthusiasm from employers um, for remote work and continuing remote work as we kind of move out of this, um, this pandemic world. Um, and so that's something that I'm really excited to see um, continued and hopefully that also gives flexibility to our, our military spouses um, as they have to move um, due to military moves, perhaps, you know, they're able to give the, be able to be given the flexibility to um, maintain their jobs in this remote world that we're now in. Awesome. Chrissy? I mean, she pretty much said everything I was going to say. So it, it really, I mean, she, Kira, you're absolutely right. It changed, it changed the, um, the landscape of hiring and and, and now, you know, um, of course, back to office. And um, I know Melissa could probably talk to this as well, but like back to office and um, hybrid models. What does that even mean? So you're seeing all these different, you know, languages out there on your um, job adverts, but it, it did, it changed that landscape. And I think, to be honest with you, the talent market and now, um, as a military spouse, you have a voice. You can now say, nope, I'm sorry, I'm only going to work remote. I know it started, um, I'm going to age myself, but Gen Z and um, millennials started pushing, I, I don't want to be in nine to five in a cubicle. And then it was, you know, hitting heads there on that type of movement within the workforce and then COVID. And that really changed everything and made everybody see that, you know, you can work from anywhere and make it happen and do yoga at nine o'clock in the morning. I want to add something, Jamie. Um, okay. You know, um, when I start, I started my role here in 2016, and I remember through the course of 2017 or so, in, with my local uh, employment office and other military partners, we used to conduct remote work webinars, remote work info sessions, and it was always like it, it attracted so many military spouses wanting to find out the the, the magical key and how to land that career, right? Uh, you know, that you that allow you to work from home or to travel with you. Now, fast forward to now, obviously remote work is more abundant, but we still have 
Obviously, the challenges military spouse uh, unemployment and underemployment is still still extremely high. Why? I mean, remote work is now so abundant everywhere, right? According to our lifestyle survey, over 35% of military spouses still want to work, can't find work, or cannot find the resources or availability to do so. But I think a great deal that with this abundance of remote work is also the challenge that we also have to invest a little time in educating, retraining, or understanding the, the what remote work really is. Remote work is not always the same for everyone. Um, and is not always, it doesn't require you to, to have, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't have the same flexibility all over the place. Plus some of them are very tech sort of driven and others are not so tech driven, but enough for you to understand what are some of those um, sort of a personal, uh, personal development and investing in some of those milestones for you to prepare yourself to be very um, competitive. Because one of the things now with the pandemic that it did remote work is that it's open for everyone. So we're not just competing among the military spouse environment and, and community. We're competing with everyone across the world, all everyone, all talented people within our local communities. So as military spouses continue to navigate, you know, the military, uh, the unemployment and, and underemployment challenge, you need to really set yourself up part and continue on to stay in this upskilling sort of a wagon if you if if you don't mind me say so especially if you've been out of the workforce for a long time take and and, and you know um, educate yourself a little bit more on certain processes when it comes to employ uh, project management tools things that you need for certain roles that just because it's remote work it doesn't mean that it's, it's perhaps adaptable to our to our lifestyle and it's good. It took me many years <laughs> into my remote work lifestyle to train my family first to understand that just because I was home, it didn't mean that I was there. I, I still could go out and throw my load of laundry. I could still be their personal chef and do all these other things. I still had some responsibilities that I needed to navigate it. So that, you know, it's also an, another thing that you need to prepare and, and, and train your family on, on some of those best practices and how to let you be a career-minded military military spouse working remotely, you know, and I don't know how many of you guys, but did you know, investing as little as, for instance, Zoom has a lot of those trainings, you know, that you can do from, uh, do, uh, you know, upgrade your sort of awareness and how to do that. Zoom and all these different places, you know, understand what are some of those different careers that you can go into and then learn what are some of those tools and gadgets that you most likely will be presented and challenged to adapt to your career environment. You know, Zoom, I'm, I'm constantly registering for Zoom meetings, you know, how to conduct a better hybrid meeting, how to conduct a better webinar and all these things. I still miss a lot of, a lot of tips and tricks, but I'm better at conducting one of those now because I attend some of those info sessions that they do it, they're free at no cost. So do a little bit more uh, on your end because you're complete competing against the global market, not just anymore the military spouse. And the, the military spouse market alone is a quite large market. I know that uh, the numbers change constantly year over year, but we have, uh, if you count just active duty spouses, we, we have up to a million active duty spouses. But then if you count the spouses of veterans, we have as high as 10 or 11 million military spouses in this country. It's a huge group of people. So even if you were just competing against other military spouses, it's a lot of people. Um, I wanna talk about resources for a moment. I saw some buzz in the chat about resume styles and resume types. I wanna remind everyone that we do have each of these experts in the resources booths or the vendor booths on the Whova app. Uh, Denise Lewis and Military Spouse Jobs, they specifically help with resumes. And so if you're interested in the various resume types, uh, you can go to Denise through the Whova app and connect and try to get some resume assistance there. Um, additionally, on the topic of resources, the next question I have, we have a big group of people that we're talking about, military, military spouses and veterans. We also have over 40,000 service organizations that serve military families. And that's a lot of resources for somebody to go trying to boil the ocean and look for different resources to get the help that they need. The panelists here, I would love to hear about your experience with perhaps if you've met someone that has tried to find a resource and failed and your advice for somebody who is overwhelmed with the abundance of resources out there for them in the military community. And this is sort of all hands, anybody who would like to answer. 
I'll start if you don't mind. Well, you know, and how I kind of start off the conversation in my introduction is I was a spouse that had, you know, those issues. Um, 32 years of marriage, 26 years, um, 26 moves, master's degree, um, and I would fill up, you know, fill in applications and constantly hear, although you're qualified for the job, you're not the candidate, you know, and, and, and that was kind of demeaning sometimes. And I used to question, you know, why me? Um, but, you know, the one thing that really invigorates me about working for military spouse jobs is we are one of the oldest, so I might be the senior member on the panel, but our organization is one of the oldest, um, started in 2004. Um, and since 2010, we have now gone over 78,000 hires for veterans and um, spouses. And our job board updates every 24 hours. So, um, you know, that's another unique thing about our organization is that we don't have jobs that just hang on the job site. And once you talk to our career specialist, we get you, you know, a targeted resume because we have over 3,000 employer partners. And because that what makes us unique with that is that we know exactly what they want. So we help you write that targeted resume. And as a candidate, if um, that employer really you know, um, likes your resume but wants you to tweak up an upskill course, we can offer that upskill course and that will go on your resume. So once you go with from the uh, career specialist, then you go to our recruiter connect specialist. And that's what makes our organization um, specialized and unique is that recruiter connect specialist works with that recruiter employer. So you become an internal candidate, not an external candidate. And so we basically hand off your resume to that employer. And maybe if there was something that didn't really match on your application, that employer will contact um, our Recruiter Connect Specialist and let that Recruiter Connect Specialist know maybe what happened, maybe in the interview process um, or something like that. So um, that really makes us really specialized and unique. And so if you really need any help, we are here to help. And I wish I had it, you know, several years again, but I'm glad to work for the organization. And if you want to be a career specialist at our organization, we have tons of opportunities um, available and we work remotely. We're independent contractors. So if you're interested in it and you have a human resource background or business background, um, reach out to me um, in my book. Thank you, Denise. I had, I saw a comment in the chat. I wanted to address it. And we have the perfect panel of experts here to talk about this specific topic. Um, the comment says, basically, I've applied for a ton of jobs online and my resume is going into a black hole. What the heck do I do about it? Does anybody want to take that question? I'll jump real quick. It, there can be even so many factors um, in play here. Um, the very first one I'd start with is you have to apply close to when the roles open. I highly recommend you get a professional email address, first name, dot, last name, not hot mama at Gmail. You just make it professional and then send sign, sign up for job alerts. Have all of your job alerts sent to that email address. That way you can delete those jobs as they come in that you're not interested in, but you can't go back in time and reapply for a job that's already passed. So it's easy walking through the store, you get an alert. Oh, this is my dream job. I've been waiting for this job to open. Click apply, boom, done. That's the first thing. Second thing, tailoring that resume. I know we keep talking about this. You really have to tailor that resume. Recruiters, honestly, guys, only have about 12 seconds to review that resume. And you need to tell them in 12 seconds that they want to talk to you. How do you do that? You tailor it to whatever your background is or whatever area skill set you want to be in and then thirdly you have to meet all of those minimum requirements period if you don't meet the minimum requirements the recruiter will never see your resume now there are some sites that are different you have somebody mentioned it earlier about doing your homework first yes you have to do your homework because some companies such as usaa we use live human beings to look at your resume some sometimes we get 200 applicants to one job so how do you stand out? You have to tailor and make sure you're telling that recruiter immediately you have the skill set. 
Some other companies such as usajobs.com launch your mother made a name, your blood type and six pages and it's keyword and it's a system. The ATS looks for percentages of words. So do your Google search, look in glassdoor.com, get networked on LinkedIn and see how other individuals ATS systems work. But those are the three main things to help you get a leg up. And then also that networking piece. We have so many talent scouts, which are headhunters, um, actively headhunting talent and they look on LinkedIn and you need to connect with them and you need to make an introduction and you need to copy and paste that resume and put it right on LinkedIn because we're using it for Boolean searches to look for our talent. I said three, but I think that was four. <laughs> well, I'll ditto as well. Every company, uh, speaking from my Amazon hat here, every company has their own quirky process that they use to evaluate resumes or to evaluate talent. Um, and from the Amazon side of the house, one of the best ways to get in front of people is through a warm lead in or a warm referral. And so let's just say you're friends with me and I'm Jamie and you give me your resume and I give it to the, the person in charge of that job requisition. Uh, that'll get you in front of somebody guaranteed at Amazon. We put the white gloves process on for that. Uh, and, and in many companies, it's the same way. So that would be my one tip is just, if possible, try to ask someone that you know that works at that specific company for that handoff, and that'll tremendously help your odds. Does anyone else but, want to chime in? But let me add, if you are ready to ask for that extra warm handover or you know that extra red carpet laid up, please be sure that you are career ready and that you have done on your end your homework because there's nothing more devastating on my end is when I send a nice warm referral and then my referral doesn't answer, doesn't respond, is not ready, they didn't tailor the resume. It doesn't work like that Like that. also. Remember, it's always also still at the end of the day, it's a business need. And the employer, the nonprofit, as much as they love military community and they wanna support, they have to find the most qualified, talented individual who's gonna get in there and make things happen ASAP on Tuesday, done, they start working. So you have to be ready to really take advantage of that referral, take advantage of that process that that individual, Jamie, is gonna get us in into Amazon, but you have to look her, make her look good. She's gonna go hand over your resume. Your resume has to be top notch so that they can say, wow, yes, I definitely wanna to talk to this candidate. I wanna I want to bring him on board. Because if your resume is completely all broken, outdated, and it's not matching anything, then guess what? They will say, gee, Laura, that's really not a good referral because they don't meet the qualifications. Go find me somebody else. So you have to also make sure that not only you're networking, but really looking uh, like you're ready. You are career ready. Like I always like to brag about it. Be career ready so that you can make your referral look really great when they present you for their um, for their hiring manager or whoever they're uh, you know, the point of contact might be. Thank you, Laura. I can add into that from the perspective of a smaller company. You know, we're, we're not an Amazon. So, and we're not USAA. We don't have headhunters working on our behalf. And we don't have a big, a lot of larger organizations will have a computer system. So you have to figure out how to talk. You're not, your first vetting isn't to a human being. It's through a computer system that's looking for keywords and specific critical, you know, items. And if your resume doesn't include those, you don't get the interview. You don't get pushed on to the next step. For me, I am manually looking through those resumes. In our chat today, there's been a lot of question about how do I tell that story of my volunteer experience, my resume gaps, et cetera. If you are applying to a job in a smaller organization and do your research on what kind of organization you're applying to, know who, I mean, I cannot count the number of times I've interviewed somebody and I ask them in every interview, tell me what you know about me and us. Because I want to know if they've done their research. And if they say, uh, and they start repeating back anything I've told them in the resume, or in the interview, they're a no. So do your homework, know what size organization you're applying to, and think, because the size organization will in part determine what process you should use, what style resume you should use. If you're applying to a smaller organization like ours, you know, 90 employees, a human being is going to read your resume uses an opportunity to weave what otherwise feels to you like disjointed career experiences into a story of who you are and where you're going. If you can do that, and that is not an easy skill, but if you can take your, I mean, in my, in, in my background, I was the bizarre chair 
for the International Bazaar at Hohenfels Army Base in Germany. That sounds like a one-off, unrelated thing to my professional experiences until you take into account that I was working with 80 vendors from seven countries. We made X number of you know tens of thousands of dollars that week in business. When you tell that story as I basically ran a small business, a small international business over the course of a six-month time frame to raise this much money with the outcome of producing scholarships for this many people this year, all of a sudden you've taken that thing that felt like a, a single item on a resume and you've woven it into a story of, um, uh, uh, in my case, it was a story of an excellent communicator who was who had really strong project management experiences and was adaptable and ready to take on whatever the next challenge was. Think about what your overall story is and then weave those otherwise just, you know, maybe what you would consider to be one-off volunteer experiences or short-term jobs and focus more on what is the overarching arc of that story and then where you're trying to go instead of thinking of it as a bullet list of I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. And if you do that and you're applying to a smaller organization, I think your chances of getting an interview will be much better because you're not looking at it as disjointed, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. You're trying to communicate through that resume who you are and what values and what strengths you're going to bring to the future of that organization. And that will catch the hiring manager's attention. Thank you, Melissa. I love the detail. You know, I want to just pull it out a little bit more is providing some context, scope, and scale to the reader. So if we just read that bizarre project manager position on your resume, we would have no idea but you've enumerated it. You provided numbers for context, scope, and scale so that we know it was 80 vendors across five countries and seven whatever it was, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I will say just that in my organization, that's what our recruiters are trained to look for. That's what our hiring managers ask you about during the interview is the scale of the work that you've done because you're going to enter into a large organization and expect it to be able to handle the scale we have. All right, so we're having five more minutes left. Um, one more question, and now it's actually going to be closer to the end because I have two events mixed up in my head. But um, military spouse unemployment, it has long term ramifications on a military spouse's career from now all the way through retirement. I would just love to kind of think about this in the bigger picture. And, and a comment was made earlier about how I don't believe it's, you know, some military spouses don't believe it's worth working right now because the return on investment may not outweigh what you make for covering childcare. So if anybody doesn't mind just providing a quick, what do you, what advice do you have for military spouses to help prevent long-term negative impacts of being perpetually unemployed or underemployed? I know I was the last one to talk, but I'm passionate about this one. And I actually had a note earlier, think long-term. The very, the first few freelance jobs I got did not fully pay for childcare. But my husband and I talked about it and we realized that it was more important long-term for me not to have a two-year resume gap than it was for us to worry about, you know, whatever the incremental amount of money was that I, that I wasn't able to cover in childcare based on my freelance income at the time. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for that. So as you're making those daily decisions about how you're going to prioritize your, your dependent care, how you're going to prioritize your home office, your technology, all of those things, Think about them as, you know, is this going to pay off in five years? Is this going to help me achieve my 10-year career goal? Because if you're constantly not doing the small things now to prepare for that longer term, you're not going to get there. You're going to be the person who either doesn't have child care when the job opportunity comes or doesn't have the right technology to do the online, you know, video interview or, or, or. So always at every step of that process, speak with your service member, speak with your spouse, prioritize your family's budget, your family's resources in order to serve both of your long-term career goals. It's not just their career that matters, it's yours too, and for more reasons than money. So think long-term at each step of the way. Thank you, Melissa. And I'm one of the, you know, as I talk about one of the senior uh, panelists or cast members, you know, my children are grown and I was starting to search for who am I? You know, I was, you know, my kid's mom, you know, an army volunteer, my husband's spouse, but who am I? So you kind of get lost, 
you know, with that. So stay engaged, stay relevant, even, you know, if you have been out of the workforce, but you want to stay in that career, try to stay relevant with that career, either volunteering, you know, at a agency that you um, are passionate about, Um, because sometimes it is hard to find that unicorn job, um, but be open to a variety of opportunities, because you never know where that'll take you. Absolutely. And I second that, Denise. Um, My husband, when he retired, none of this was set up as well, right? And so we're on the other end of it. And how do you stay relevant? And um, volunteer. But not only volunteer, offer to be a mentor. There's betteraudi.com and there's another one that starts with an A. And if somebody knows it, please say it. But um, they're mentorship platforms. And the system does everything for you. And you can provide advice to others or you become ACP. Thank you, Jamie. Um, You can provide, uh, you know, your best practices and you could even ask for mentors. So um, it's perfect. And, And that keeps you relevant and keeps you active in the community and doing what you love to do. Thank you all. Like, Julie? Like to add, oh, oh, sorry. Laura, Laura, one little bit. Of one time. more time. Yes, volunteer with a purpose, but with a purpose. If you are going to volunteer, be intentional about the time and the amount of time you give up to the volunteer opportunity. I've been with so many spouses who volunteer 40 hours a week. Guess what? That distracts you from really focusing on your job search. Now you get loaded with a non-paid job. So volunteer with a purpose. And if you must have a job because income is really, really hard sometimes in certain communities, find a temp agency that will place you somewhere temporary, work temporary five, six months, take a break, work another work, make some money, stay relevant. Yes, it doesn't defeat the purpose of uh filling the gaps but guess what when you work with one temp agency for a long time that is the temp agency that is tracking your career growth so look, look into it and take advantage of some of those um local thank temp you, agencies Laura. that can help you julie back to you thank you so much everyone um for being here today i really appreciate everyone's time and i just want to like well i'm going to give out those I'm going to give out those prizes, right? But um, there's been so much great conversation today and I want to implore everyone, this isn't the end of this conversation. This is just your start, okay? So now you've got your homework. You've been connected with all these fantastic resources. Everyone has their contact information in their exhibitor booths and you've got we've got a community board discussion with your LinkedIn contacts so now you can go and connect with some other people and share what you're working on and keep that uh, conversation going so our winner of the $50 Amazon gift card compliments of blue star families is Vince a facing, I'm not sure if I said your name right, Vince. Congratulations. And the HP Chromebook is Alexis Kimotho. So thank you everyone for being here today. I really appreciate uh, the sponsorship from USAA and Chrissy being here from USAA and tutor.com and all of our other panelists and experts who shared their time. Um, I There was a couple other questions that we didn't get to. So any of you want to go back in that chat and answer them? after we get off here. Um, I'd appreciate it. And if you have friends that were not able to join us today, please encourage them to register for the event on the 16th. We will be recording this and this will be out on our LinkedIn uh, channel. So I hope that you've enjoyed connecting in Whova. If it's your first time, then the next time will be easier. I, I promise you. So with that, I'm going to bid everyone to fond farewell and thanks again for everything that you all do to help the mill spouse community with their employment.